Hello and welcome to News Click. We have with us Ambassador Badra Kumar, who used to be in the Indian Foreign Service, an ambassador to Turkey at one point, played a very important role in Indian foreign policy, particularly in a certain area. Coming to the G20, which is taking place right now, uh, Ambassador Bhattu Kumar, do you see a sp any specific role that G20 has today, particularly in the context that there is a Ukraine war, there is a NATO-Russia standoff on Ukraine, and of course there is also, with respect to China, a US-China tech war, which of course uses Taiwan as the uh, as a kind of piece, centerpiece on that, particularly from the US side, but it's really a much wider war. Uh, technological war, economic war, if you will. So what role do you see of G20? Well, you know, on G20, let's uh, recall in the first instance, its genesis, you know. It was born in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2007-2008, uh, uh, when it became uh, extremely apparent for any, anyone and everyone uh, that uh, the G7, which used to be the locus of, uh, you know, economic diplomacy, of uh, um, economic order and political order, therefore, that uh, has changed and uh, the locus has shifted out away from the G7. And therefore, the Western countries, and particularly Obama, um, uh, felt that there was a requirement to assimilate these changes. So what they try to do is they try to assimilate these changes without surrendering their leadership role. The leadership role that was a product of this Bretton Woods system, you know, the, that uh, they try to contrive to let that continue, but uh, uh, appearance wise, giving the, what we call the global South today or the emerging powers at that time, essay. Because uh, you see, without that, uh, the uh, danger was there that the emerging powers will, from their platform, start challenging the Western supremacy, the Western hegemony over the economic order. So you see, it was, a, it was, a, it was really geopolitical in that sense, the formation of the G20. And um, uh, a lot of help was available from uh, countries such as India, which were uh, aware that it will be a subaltern role, but some role will be better than no role. And India's, uh, uh, India coming on board meant that uh, G20 attracted a, a lot of other countries, um, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, you know, like that, Indonesia, and so on. But since then, what has happened is in 2010, the Americans introduced the uh, pivot to Asia. The, their own uh, assumptions regarding China's rise, that they would be able to absorb and they would be able to reform China in the sense that they would be able to make uh, uh, introduce liberal democracy in, in uh, China and so on. That was the earlier notion. All those things apart, they almost came to the conclusion that China is what it will determine itself to be. And it will not be a prototype of the Western world. And uh, so you see this China's rise uh, was uh, in qualitative terms was perceived differently, began to be felt differently. And that led to the announcement of the pivot to Asia. Um, confrontation wasn't there at that point uh, to the extent that we see today when we speak even about a possibility of war. But uh, the, the kind of detong that was there, you know, in uh, between the United States and uh, within the Western world and China, that uh, started receding. It gave way to competition. So you see, the that was one factor there. But uh, when we come to today's moment, what really changed matters is that, you know, that uh, much as we are uh, not aware of it, there is a kind of bipolarity setting in, in the world order. 
It's a curious, it's not the bipolarity that uh, we saw in the Cold War era, because uh, there is the Western world and the non-Western world. And in the non-Western world, everything is not together as one chunk, one alliance system or anything. There are dissonant voices. There are lots of uh, uh, powers, you know, which have come, which are autonomously working, Iran, for example. But uh, there's a very big uh, uh, slice of uh, the world community, which is uh, not willing to identify with the West. Uh, Ukraine thing has brought it to the fore with a abruptness which uh, even shocked the Americans. You know, the fact is they are isolated now. The West is isolated. And um, other countries are just mutely watching. They refuse to impose sanctions against Russia. And then the kind of a behavior on the part of the Western countries, that has also um, shocked the other countries, you know, because it's a, uh, they're freezing the uh, assets of another country. It was completely contrary to the promise that we have pledged that the United States made in the early 1970s when the dollar replaced uh, gold as a world currency. Yes. Now, you see, it was that, that uh, decision, that transformation took place on the basis of an understanding that the United States is committed and the United States made the commitment that it will allow purchasing power in dollars for all countries in the world. And Saudi Arabia then said that the trading in oil will take place in dollars, that the, uh, the, the, the trading houses in London or wherever, you know, when they will also trade in dollars. And all countries needed to trade in dollars. On the basis of that, countries kept their reserves in dollars in, in the Western banks. And then suddenly this has never happened before like this. You know, in the case of Russia, it's a massive amount of $300 billion, which is just frozen. And it is, uh, it's, it's money that uh, the country earned, its income was appropriated. So this is like in the Wild West in American history, you know, that, you know, the strong man can do what he likes. So you see, a lot of countries are watching this. Now, for example, in Washington Post had a uh, report, a leaked report, and you know, it's an establishment paper. So it is done with a purpose, whoever has leaked it. A CIA report on the United Arab Emirates. And it's very interesting. They have, the CIA has given a report saying that just as the United States said each that Russia was manipulating the American politics, domestic politics, United Arab Emirates, UAE, has uh, interfered in a very significant way in American politics, bribing their way through and so on. Now, it's a very nasty report. It says it's a one step away from threatening that uh, it qualifies for American sanctions. Saudi Arabia again, OPEC plus, etc. Now, why are these countries today going to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS? Because uh, they see the writing on the wall that tomorrow, if there is going to be an unpleasant encounter with the Americans on any plane, they have to be watchful and all their assets are kept in the Western banks, you know. So you see, this is the world that we are living in today. Therefore, when I said multipolarity, it is multipolarity in one sense, West versus the rest. And within the rest, there is again a, a, a certain uh, um, strategic autonomy that countries are uh, working out, you know. Now, therefore, you know, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia was, you know, a very staunch uh, supporter of the United States. That was the only reason it qualified itself to be a member of the G20. Because uh, Saudi Arabia's credentials, it's just uh, an economy built on just one commodity, you know. But uh, it, the Americans wanted it to be there because it, it was there. But today, see where the situation is. So it illustrates Turkey, a NATO member, and so Americans assume that it is going to, you know, sing the American tune all the time. But today, Erdogan is on a path of his own. But it's an interesting picture that you're make, you know, drawing out. And this is something that we have been watching on a different way, in a different way. We looked at the trade that, for instance, the United States had 
in say 70s and 80s up to the 90s that at that point of time, the US was a major trading partner of most countries in the world. Today, it's yes. China. Yes. If we look at the European Union, its major engineering industry, in fact, its industry plus its domestic energy consumption was met with Russian gas and oil, yes. as well as coal, in fact. So yes. that was the major source of energy. While mm -hmm. the Chinese, Today have become the largest global trading partner for 80% yeah. of the countries or 70% yeah. of the countries in the world. Yeah. So this is the change that we see that primary commodities is, US is a bit of an outlier on that because it does do agriculture, it has energy reserves and so on. But otherwise, if you take the, all the other advanced capitalist countries, as you would say, they're all dependent today on finance. They neither have energy, nor do they do primary commodities, nor do they do manufacturing. So the world focus, therefore, shifting, as you have pointed out, there is a larger economic productive base to that, and that's manifest itself. And also we have maps showing, as you were talking, uh, that we have what is G7 in terms of the world economy or in terms of world's population. Mm -hmm. What is the amount of area they occupy in the world compared mm -hmm. to the rest? And the mm -hmm. only continent which is not represented in G20, apart from South Africa, is actually Africa. That, mm -hmm. That is very weakly present. As I said, only one country from uh, Africa is present. So it doesn't seem to represent also the rest of the globe in a meaningful way. And what you're pointing out on the reports that I'm, we are also getting from uh, G20 from Bali, that the West has come with a fortress mentality. It doesn't want to engage in any discussion. Its one point agenda is to, what you exactly have said, to basically delegitimize G20 because it serves no purpose. So they want to go back to their G7 and tell the rest of the world what they think should happen. That seems to be the trajectory Bali is going to follow after which India is going to be the president of G20, uh, but essentially president of something which seems to be, according to you and according to the reports that we seem to get, that the Western world is not interested anymore in G20. You know, it doesn't serve their purpose anymore. That's the whole point. It doesn't serve their purpose because it was conceived for entirely different reasons. And on the basis of assumptions which have... Uh, proven to be no longer relevant, you know, those uh, things. You see, the we are seeing right in front of us the transformation that has taken place in the international system. Now, nobody expected this to just erupt so suddenly. The war in Ukraine, you know, has uh, introduced a terrible beauty, actually, in the international system. That uh, for the first time, there is a strategic defense of the weaponization of sanctions. Look at Iran, for example, a country which has been under sanctions ever since its birth of the Islamic Republic. It, is, it has not seen uh, a day in its life without American sanctions. And now today, you know, it has uh, come to a situation that a superpower for uh, fighting a war is taking help from it, from Iran. So, you know, the world has changed. That is something which we have to accept. It's uh, not only, you know, you see, we cannot separate, actually, in my opinion, the international economic order and the political order. Because uh, in the way that these things have uh, flown through history, uh, good politics is always about economics. And without economics, politics doesn't make sense. So, you see, this is how, you know, it is. Ambassador Bhandrakumar, I would just add that geostrategic dimension to this, geography also plays a role. And if you go back to Mackinder, who said the world island is really Eurasia, and then there is this mm -hmm. other island called America, North America. Mm -hmm. And what happens in Eurasia, the world island, mm -hmm. that will decide the future. And that's what the US problem today is. 
the Eurasian yes. landmass is getting out of their yes. control. Yes. So the economy, the geopolitics, which is geography, mm. and of course people, that's what is really yeah. going to determine the ultimate. No, Mackinder's, uh, Mackinder's uh, theory has, uh, you know, is uh, proving right, actually, you know. And the Americans came up with their uh, counter theory of this so-called island, you know, island th uh, theory, you know, that uh, if you control the seas, Ocean, you control the ocean theory. Oceans. Control yeah, North ocean. Atlantic, control Pacific, yeah. then you can control. Then you are the you are the king. I, you you really look at it, and if you put uh, if you if you put a checklist in front of you, where is it that China has uh, done something against the United States? Never. <laughs> you know, its uh, attitude is always one of you know readiness to work with the United States, and uh, it is very happy with the interdependency there. You know. So it is all about, you know, hegemony. And uh, the Western it's countries very, have rallied Europe. Very, hmm? It's very existence and the size of its economy and its growth makes it a danger. That's the way yes, it, yes. the United States. Yes, yes. So, you know, the uh, uh, coming to our uh, area, G20, this is a manifestation of uh, the what something that we need to expect now that multilateralism the way that uh, we understood multilateralism, this is not only G20, you know, I mean, you are a great expert on climate. You know, uh, after all the hullabaloo about climate in uh, Scotland and all that, that uh, summit and all, where are things today? You know, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's take, gone to the back burner, you know, and um, important countries are not even showing up there, you know, in Egypt. So, you know, uh, so multilateralist trade, uh, WTO, so you see, trade, G20, climate, all these are showing the stresses and strains that have come into world politics and the kind of fracturing that has taken place where it is becoming very difficult to really resort to consensual politics. And at the same time, no single country is any longer capable of solving the world's problems. So, you know, these uh, as a, so it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of circumstances also that way. As a Chinese saying says, we live in interesting times. And that means we <laughs> live in dangerous times. The yeah. world changing, uh, particularly when the one hegemon wanes. And even if a multipolar world arises, it is a dangerous moment in history because no empire yes. lets go of its hegemony. Yes, nicely, yes. politely, and slowly. Yes. So that is that yes. is where we are at at the moment. A dangerous moment in history because we are seeing wars continue now involving major powers who have the ability mm -hmm. to destroy the world many times over, while mm -hmm. the other wars haven't gone away. Your wars in Africa that yeah. are taking place with United States having a number of military bases, which they don't even tell you how many bases they have and so on. But nevertheless, what you have pointed out is absolutely the today the fulcrum of the, uh, shall we say, the new era around which it will hinge, which is United States and China. How does this uh, contradiction play out? And of course, what's happening in Europe, which is really NATO versus Russia in Ukraine. These are the two really... Yeah, you know, I, 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 I must add one caveat that uh, I do not expect even in another 10 years time or something after China has overtaken the United States. I do not, I'm not convinced if somebody says that China will behave the same way as the Americans. You see, the China's behavior will be very different. So, um, and that is why I said that there will be multipolarity, available space for multipolarity is something that China will concede. And we'll China is not going to take it. I'll come back to this yes. discussion because I have a theory why it is so that land mm. trade, which is what is the crux of China, mm. a lot of the Belt Road initiative is really that, it has to be cooperative unlike maritime trade, which actually can be one-to-one. -one. And in fact, 
That mm-hmm. is why you, are, you have seen the European powers behaved very differently with respect to hegemony than the landed, even earlier empires seem to have done. But that's a longer discussion. But I completely agree with you that China, the way they have developed their trade has been through a cooperative exercise. But as I said, yes, particularly India and China, we know that we have a contradiction yes. because of the borders we share. And therefore, of course, mm-hmm. that, that is always a fertile ground for tension. But apart from that, India, China, Russia, all of them are major land powers. So is Iran and Turkey. Therefore, yeah. the Eurasian land They have a shared uh, common, common interests. They have common interests. And this is what, uh, uh, this is the tragedy of the situation. One of the things, you know, that the Western world is exploiting is that, you know, that uh, the kind of unity that uh, uh, is uh, possible and it can be very dangerous. So somehow it should not take shape in that way. You know, even this price cap and this uh, Treasury Secretary's arrival here. Why is it so important for uh, the United States that it's India, India, India's, from pos- United, from India's China, position, from Russia. because it's an Asian country, and we are talking about another Asian power, Russia. And there is another Asian power to the east, which is China. So, you know, if a common ground, you know, develops between these three powers, then the game is over. You know, it's a check and checkmate. That is the problem. And of course, you have Turkey at one hand and Southeast Asia on the other. But again, and Iran, as you have pointed out. One day, I I mentioned about... We need to discuss the Eurasian... I mentioned about the... uh, I mentioned about the Washington Post article. Yes. This is again out of uh, sheer yes. frustration, you know, frustration that, you know, that Biden went there to that region in August and personally took a hand no in traction. this. To, you know, and this time now about you have seen in the newspapers that Washington Post article sensationalizing that there is a, going to be an imminent Iranian attack on Saudi Arabia. So the Americans immediately put their forces on alert and... Uh, pledged that they will move heaven and earth to see that Saudi Arabia comes to no harm. Saudis were not impressed. They, they, they didn't even open their mouths. They were just not, they ignored, in fact, the American pledge, you know. So you see, this region, which is so important for the Western world, you mentioned rightly that Americans are now no longer importers in that sense. They are not dependent on the Middle East oil. But Europeans, we have seen it, Europeans. And... Uh, the, uh, the whole crisis today in Europe is this boomerang from the sanctions against Russia. It has come to haunt them because, as you correctly said, you know, the prosperity of Germany has been built on two pillars. One is the cheap, predictable, uh, seamless quantities of oil, you know, which are possible to be brought in through pipelines eh? and, and gas brought in through pipelines uh, from Russia. And secondly, the cheap goods from China. You know, these are, so, you know, you see, Scholz has gone to China, you know, because, uh, the, uh, the, and, you know, the, we need actually a bigger discussion on this because, um, you know, we need to really explore what prompted the United States, in fact, to destroy the Nord Stream pipelines. See where it has gone to. Germany is their strong ally. And the Germans just came to the point of saying that we know who's done it, but we will not say. (laughs) So, you know, that is up to that point they have come. So if they could do this to their their closest ally, Germany, and uh, for this, you can see what a high stakes game this has become. 